Ben McKee, West Rucker Gavals 24-7 here inside of Charles Schwab Field with our Around the Horn following Tennessee's thrilling, dramatic, frustrating, every word in the book, 4-1 uh, to win over Texas A&M to extend their season. Tennessee's going to play one more baseball game. It's going to come down to one more baseball game. Today was win number 59 for Tennessee. Win number 60 would win them their first national championship in program history. And uh, we'll have plenty of preview coverage of that up on the site and on our extended podcast, Diamond Balls podcast, uh, that we will go record as soon as we're done here. But uh, looking at today's game, I, we'll get to the offense. Obviously, there were some big, massive swings. But yeah. those swings are not made possible or do not matter if Drew Beam does not give them the start that he gave them, yeah. even if it was a little bit of a shorter outing. Aaron Combs pitches the way that he pitches. And then Nate Sneed coming in late in the game. We'll start with Beam. I mean, those... He pitched into the fifth inning, but his final line shows he pitched four. Just terrific work from Beam. And he set the tone for Tennessee and kept them in it while the offense was going through some frustrations. Yeah, it'd be interesting now to, to see, you know, what would have happened if he had kept going because, again, it's just weird that we're not seeing as long outings as we used to see. But when he was out there, he was effective, and that's what's the most important thing. Uh, and I think AM also grinds out at bats and runs up pitch counts, and they're really good at that. But, you know, Beam did his job, right? You're wondering, you know, in a game like that, whoever scores first, how big that is. Laviolette runs that ball out there, out behind us at first, and just mash that ball. And you're wondering, and you're wondering what's going on now. How's this response going to be? Well, it's what we talked about yesterday. Drew Beam's the guy you want on the mound. He is the guy with the ball in his hands. He's the guy that you want, and he just he, he shut him down. He, he just absolutely shut him down. And he, in a perfect world, it goes another inning or two, but. There's no perfect this time of year. It was really, really good. Yeah, absolutely. And then Aaron Combs comes in, and he's throwing a wiffle ball up there today. Yeah. Kind of, it's odd because we talked to him post game. Uh, he, he told you in the press conference room, told me in the lock or in, in the tunnel when we were chatting it up, that he wasn't super pleased with his command. Uh, mm -hmm. He loved. He thought his cutter was working really well, but it wasn't creating any swings and misses. But it was okay because his curveball, his breaking ball, was a wiffle ball today and he was getting a ton of swings and misses there yeah you know it's funny because we call it his curveball but i was talking to him a couple days ago and he's like you know there's really about three or four of them there are three or four different curveballs that he throws i mean sometimes intentionally sometimes maybe not intentionally um but sometimes you know he's got that more vertical one he's got kind of the roundhouse he's got a little bit more of a you know a sweeping curveball i mean he sometimes does it intentionally sometimes it just does something a little bit different and today he told me that his mechanics he did not he did not think were good and he thought he kept missing fastballs, which is true. He kept missing fastballs up. He did like the cutter, but the the curveball they they just they kept they kept missing it. And and he was he was front dooring it, back dooring it, tunneling it. I mean, it, it it was good. And he said that he had to keep adapting throughout the game because he just never got his mechanics quite right. But I mean, if that's not his best bullet, it's still pretty lethal. I mean, it yeah. got the job done. It was just season saver, unbelievable job. Yeah, absolutely. And. If, I mean, Combs is just, what you're describing is just a pitcher at work. Not yeah. not necessarily a thrower, but a, a pitcher. Yep. That, that's the mark of a good pitcher when they're able to battle through, when they don't feel like everything's clicking and they're still able to find a way to get out. Yep. That's the mark of a good pitcher. Also want to point out, Drew Beam told me that he felt like his curveball was working really well mm -hmm. as well for the second straight outing. Uh, mentioned that he made a tweak on the way to Omaha about changing kind of his arm slot on the curveball and how he feels like that's helped him. Uh, so I wanted to throw that in there as well. And then Nate Sneed pitching with the season on the line and the national championship on the line. And I asked, I said, what well, was working for you? And we both kind of had a chuckle because we both realized that it was mostly the fastball and he was just dotting it. But the thing that stands out to me most about Nate Sneed is Nate's, Nate Sneed has come such a long ways mentally. Yeah. The mentality that it took to withstand that moment is quite a bit. And the Nate Sneed that showed up on Tennessee's campus is not getting Tennessee out of that jam, but he's worked on his mentals to quote Marshawn Lynch. Uh, and, and it's become a real strength for, for him. So obviously kudos for him, to him for that. Uh, and he's also had some other people along the way, obviously Tennessee's coaches and, and some other people help him away uh, to, to really become stronger mentally. And I felt like that was just as beneficial for him as the fastball was today. Yeah, I mean, it, it, listen, I mean, country hardball helps, right? I mean, you can, I mean, he's still, I mean, it, it's that time of the year where I don't know if any of them are really at their strongest. You know, Zelo's down a couple of notches from where we, we see it a lot, um, but it's still really firm and that cutter still cuts and, and he's still got that stuff and you know if you're not ready mentally especially as a pitcher if you're not ready between the ears when you step on that mound you've either got to be either like an arrogant guy or you've got to be a quite confident guy 
you know, uh, or you got to be a guy who's so oblivious that he's unaffected. There's a few different ways to do it, but the bottom line is you have to be one of those things and you got to be who you are and, and whatever it is for him, it, it's working. He has gotten, it's not like people aren't touching him. He's not getting a ton of strikeouts, but he's still doing a really, really nice job. I mean, hey, maybe caught a tiny bit of a break there at the end, but hey, he got the job done. That was big and, and that's, he's done that really all postseason for Tennessee. And, you know, I, I, I selfishly love him more as a back end guy than I do as like a long reliever or starter type, but either way, he's been a dog. Yeah, that last fly ball, I think, gave uh, Tennessee fans quite the scare. Not a millimeter on the bat, and that's yeah, a little different. Yeah, absolutely. Kavar Steers tracks it down on the warning track. Offensively, a uh, frustrating, frustrating day for most of the day. Uh, Dylan Dryling comes up with a big two-run homer in the seventh inning. Until that point, Tennessee had led off the first four innings with the leadoff batter reaching. Yeah. Had nothing to show for it. They were 0 for 16 when Dryling hit that homer with runners on base. They were 0 for 7 with runners in scoring position. And then Dylan Dryling, he has been the most valuable player for Tennessee at the College World Series. And after today, mm -hmm. I don't know that it's even close. And he comes through with another big swing again. 1-1 fastball right at the, the bell. I mean, just perfectly in, in Dylan's swing path. And I mean, he, he just, he, he hits it over the bullpen. You know, when you talk about those kind of oblivious guys, sometimes I, I wonder if Dryling's in that in that camp because if you just know the kid you know what I'm talking about you know he's such a nice kid but he, he's not a big talker he's not a big loud guy he's just kind of in his own world in some ways but he in his own way is ruthless and, and you know for Tennessee throughout that day you know you would talk about mentality as a pitcher A&M's pitchers are mentality monsters those guys have some stuff especially Cortez my god that stuff is gross but they're just with, with their pitching coach Max Wiener best name in the world it, it's they are mentality monsters and, and they kept making big pitches when they need to Tennessee was kind of running its head against a, a wall but you just you got to keep got to keep going you got to keep punching you got to keep punching you got to keep leaning on him they needed to get Cortez out of the game and they did and, and then they got to that freshman because they didn't want to go to Oshenbeck necessarily just yet and and Tennessee made him pay for that if you don't get Cortez out of the game right I mean even like you know some of those at bats where Amick and other guys are facing eight nine ten at bats and they're getting out that's a good at bat the mission there is to get Cortez the hell off the mound. They did that, and then Drawling put a big swing on a ball, and it helped him win the game. Yeah, absolutely. And then Cal Stark, I mean, he, he's the man of, of much criticism of late. You and I are guilty of it with our yeah. post-game reaction last night. And he was 0 for 16 entering the mm -hmm. at bat in the eighth inning uh, where he hit a two-run homer. I mean, just absolutely ran into a baseball well over 400 feet, cleared the bullpen, if I'm not mistaken, the Texas a bullpen. And that proved to be big insurance runs. Even though AM never scored late in those innings when they were kind of trying to rally, those were big insurance runs. And when you pair that with the pickoff that he had at first, yet again, like he's done all season, Cal Stark was as big of an MVP as Dylan Dryden. Because if he doesn't make that throw, then who knows what happens in that inning? Well, what if little it, up. it was two outs, but like it, it was, like you said, it was puckered up there. So it, you, you pair that defensive play with the home run, and, and Cal Stark. When it mattered most, not been going well for him. He was 0 for 16 in Omaha prior to that home run. Yeah. Still found a way to grit through it, and you saw the teammates' reaction, and that tells you all you need to know about Cal Stark. Yeah, Tony Vitello said he's kind of Tennessee's Jake Taylor, right? You know, if you're your good major league reference there. I mean, I mean, that's he's their guy. He's their guy, and, and that's why he ain't coming out of the game unless he's hurt. He's their guy, and you know, he's got that. He's got no matter what's going on, he's got that one swing. Said it all year long. If you throw him a fastball short tie or you hang a breaking ball, he's going to hit it over the left field wall, which is that way, not this way, but that way. He's got that in his bag. And for him just to, to kind of mentally hang in there, to, to, to keep staying sharp defensively, keep you know not letting anything get by him, making it that huge back pick, I think his seventh or eighth of the year, whatever it was, and, and then to have that swing, I mean, it, it's, listen, he, he's, they're riding with him. They're gonna ride or die with him. So get that thought out of your head if there's any, he's their guy. He's going to be there in the nine hole. He's going to be catching, and it's just a, a big moment for him. He's, he's a delight to be around. You, you can see by Ben mentioning the reaction. Everybody loves him. It's it. He's a Tennessee guy through and through. That was a big moment. Absolutely. Tomorrow night will be another big moment. Xander Seacrest will get the ball. That's not officially been announced, but I think we can safely assume yeah. that Xander is going to get the baseball and uh, win number 59 today. Win number 60 tomorrow would win Tennessee its first national championship. They'll have Xander Seacrest on the mound. 6 p.m. Central start on ESPN. We'll have plenty of coverage up at GoVols247.com. He's Wes Rucker. I'm Ben McKee.